I've been blessed in being here this morning already. I want to thank Steve for his devotions this morning, talking about the love of God, the love of our Father. And I think it set the tone well for the message that God laid on my heart. I want to bless all the fathers that are here today. It's Father's Day. We want to look to the perfect example that our Heavenly Father leaves for us. But I want to bless each and every one of the fathers that are here. And also, I want to bless those. It's not just the fathers who have children. It's the men that are speaking life into those around them. They're being a father to those that maybe don't have a father. So today, that's who the focus is. To us as men, how can we exemplify godly fatherhood to those around us? And I also want to bless the ladies that are here. I want to encourage you to take notes and to pray for the men in your life. I don't think we can quantify the value of the wives, the mothers, the sisters that are praying for us as men. And I want to bless you for that. It's vitally important. So Father's Day. What comes to mind when you think of Father's Day? What comes to your mind when you think of your father? Start thinking about that. I want to open it up at the end and allow you to have some time to share about your father, the memories you have, and also you can honor him during that time. So start thinking about that. A.W. Tozer said, What comes to mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. What comes to mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. And how we view our earthly fathers is typically how we view our heavenly father. So if your father was loving and kind, typically you'll view God in the same way. If your father was demanding and hard to please, you'll probably think of God as somebody that you can never quite measure up to, never quite be good enough for him. If your father was distant and rarely there, you'll likely view God as some strong force that's out there, but you can't quite connect. And the only time that he pays attention to you is when you do something wrong. I was challenged when I thought about this. How are we being a father to our children? What is their view of us? Are we giving them a proper view of God the Father? And I think, Larry, you stated it well. A Father's Day message, it stumped on a lot of toes, especially my own. This comes from a lot of the needs that I see in my life. So what is a father? The dictionary gives a couple definitions. A few that I liked was a man who gives care and protection to someone or something. I really like the verb is to beget or to be the source, to be a founder, to be the foundation. And I like that last part. It talks about being a foundation. We as fathers, those of us who are speaking, being a father to somebody, we're helping to lay that foundation for their spiritual life. It's an incredible responsibility. Today I want you to understand that the role of fathering is vital for the future of our families, the future of our church here, the future of our community out around us, and ultimately the future of our nation. Fathering, godly fathering depends on the future of our church here. So for our scripture reading today, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 15, 11 through 24. Luke 15, 11 through 24. A very familiar story, the parable of the lost son. And many times we read this story 
from the, the aspect of the son, the son who wasted all his inheritance, who ran away to a far-off country and, and fell into tough times. We read it from that view. But today I'd like to turn it around and read it from the view point of the father waiting at home waiting for his son to return. So I invite you to stand for the reading of the word, beginning to read in verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found, and they began to be merry. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in thanksgiving for bringing us together today. Thank you for the beautiful weather outside. Thank you for Father's Day, a day that we can look and recognize the perfect example that you set for us. And we can also honor and thank our, heavenly, or our earthly fathers here. Guide us as we look at this story, and I pray that you would impress on us the importance of godly fatherhood. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I won't make any comments on that for now. We'll go back to that later. I'd like to look at three things that we're facing in the time we're in. And one, I look at the problem that we have with fatherhood. Number two, I'd like to look at the consequences that are coming from lack of fathers in our nation. And number three, I'd like to look at the solution. What is the answer to the problem that we have? So as far as the problem, you don't have to look far to find examples of poor fathers. In the Bible, you have a long line of poor fathers. You have Eli and his sons. It says his sons were wicked. And right after that, you have Samuel doing the exact same thing. Somehow Samuel didn't get the memo. His sons were wicked as well. Followed by David. David, a man after God's own heart, struggled to be a good father to his children. He lacked, he didn't discipline them, and he didn't, didn't speak into their life. And we see the results of that by uh, Absalom rebelling against him and many more. That was followed by Solomon. Started out well, but his son Rehoboam also rebelled and lost half the nation. You can look at the Travis Yoder household. I, I was convicted the other day. I one of my children came to me in the evening. I don't even know what they wanted. They wanted me to do something with them. And I told them, I don't have time. I'm too busy. I have to do something else. And the next morning, I was driving to work, and I was convicted. Why didn't I have time for one of our children? Just take the time and spend time with them. Then you look at our nation. I have some stats here that are staggering. The results of fatherless homes. Right now, there's about 18.4 million children without a father in their home. 
that's 25% of all the children in our nation, one in four. And I just had to think, I have four children. That's one of my children not having a father. The U.S. owns a title that nobody wants, but the title of the world leader of fatherless homes. 80% of single-parent homes are led by mothers. Then Professor Max Lerner said, said something that really struck me. The vanishing father is perhaps the central fact of the changing American family structure today the lack of fathers. The New York Times Magazine stated, the welfare world of New York is a fatherless world. So what are the consequences? I'm just going to list a few here. It says, um, well, some of the stuff that I discovered when I was researching this was 85% of the youth in prison are fatherless. Children without a father are four times as likely to live in poverty, more than two times as likely to commit suicide. And 90% of youth runaways come from fatherless homes. And the stats go on and on. And the results are devastating. Now, I know this sounds really depressing, and I don't want to focus on this, but I do want to make us aware that there is a need out there. There's a need for godly fathers to stand up and be present. And all these stats don't even touch the families where the father is there but isn't engaged, isn't present. So what is the solution? Fatherhood exists in this world because it first existed in God. We can look to God for the perfect example of fatherhood. That idea, the concept of fatherhood is not something that we originated. It started with God and his original plan for the family. So let's look back at the text, Luke 15. What does godly fatherhood actually look like? What is God's concept coming through this story of what a godly father should do. As I went through this, I found six different words, six Ps that exemplify godly fatherhood. So six Ps of fatherhood. So number one, the godly father prays. This isn't found in the passage exactly, but I'm sure we can imagine the father of the prodigal son spending time on his knees begging God to bring his son back, begging God to protect his son. I'm sure we can imagine him praying and looking at the horizon and hoping that his son would appear again. And that's what we must do as fathers. We must take our children to the throne. This job is much too big for us to do by ourselves. We have to ask God to help us. So the first thing that the father does is he prays. The second thing that the father does is he's patient. Verse 20, I love how it says, And he arose and came to his father, but it says, But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Giving us the idea that the father was waiting, gazing at the rides, and just hoping that his son would return. The father was patiently waiting for his son. And I, fatherhood takes patience. One thing I had to think of, I'm sure you've all experienced this, but when you're on a trip, you get, you, uh, get on the freeway, get on the on-ramp, get on the freeway, and you're just about a mile down the road. Dad, I have to go to the bathroom. Every time. Times like that, it takes tremendous patience. But it's part of the learning and the growing process. And the other thing that we need is patience with them spiritually. They're growing, they're learning. And in that, I want to thank my father for your patience with me. I'm sure there were many times where you wondered if the lessons that you were teaching would ever take a hold. But I want to thank you, Dad, for your patience. So number two, the father is patient. Number three, the father is passionate. The father loves Steve, you touched on this, and Larry, you touched on this as well. The love of the Father is such an important thing, important part of fathering. Verse 20 says, it fell on, He fell on his neck and kissed him. He didn't care about the smell. You can imagine the smell that this son had after feeding pigs for months on end. He didn't care about the dirty clothes. 
he fell on his neck and he kissed him. The love of the Father is so important. I found a story that, that really brought this to life. It, uh, it talks about Michael. Michael felt like an outsider. Maybe it was because he was an adopted kid or because his Hollywood parents had never time for him. When his folks divorced, he was devastated. After his actor dad married Nancy, things got worse. His new stepmom tolerated no competition for his father's heart. Eventually, Nancy froze Michael out of the family circle. The lonely boy longed for two things, a hug and the three words, I love you, from his father. Michael watched from a distance as his dad went from the president of the Screen Actors Guild to governor of California to finally president of the United States. And I'm guessing you're starting to put the picture together here. Then he turned to Jesus by grasping how much his heavenly father loved him. He got over the bitterness toward his distant earthly father, but still ached for his father to embrace him and say, I love you. He was devastated when he heard that his father was in the first stages of Alzheimer's and the clock was ticking. Would Michael ever hear those three words that he desperately longed to hear? I love you. One day he saw his dad in a crowded room. His old wounds throbbed again. What would Jesus do? Michael knew the answer. He walked across the room and embraced his father. Dad, I love you. For a moment the old man was confused. Then he replied softly, I love you too. Michael says that every time he saw his father after that, he would hug him and say, Dad, I love you. After a while, the old president no longer recognized who he was, but he still knew that Michael was the one who always hugged him. Whenever his son came into the room, the president, president Reagan's face would light up as he opened his arms wide for his hug. Michael later wrote in a, in a newspaper column, the best gift that my father left me was the knowledge that he had a personal relationship with Jesus and he is waiting for me in heaven. Just tremendous, the power of the Father's love. Michael went through the majority of his life longing to have that love from his Father. So love your children. The fourth thing the Father does is he, he provides. In verses 17 and 18, the Son is talking about how many hired servants my fathers have, and he has bread in bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. He knew that if he returned home, that there would be plenty of food there. His father had provided more than enough. Even if he was a servant, he was going to have plenty of food. But most of all, not just physically, we provide spiritual and emotionally for our children. I had to think, what are some ways we can provide for our children? Number one, spiritually, family devotions. Spending time each night in family devotions. The other thing that I like to do with some of our children is to ask them questions. Ask them questions how their day was. What was the worst part? What was the best part? Then emotionally, find out what their love language is. Sometimes we miss connecting because we're not speaking the right language. And I'm just going to quickly share what our four children's love languages are. Johnny wasn't sure about this. <laughs> but Johnny's love languages are acts of service and quality time. And so if I try to share with him in physical touch or words of affirmation, it doesn't have the impact that it does when I speak his language. For uh, Josie, it's gifts, loves gifts. She's always excited to get a gift. For Shiloh, it's quality time. Quality time is something that takes time, it takes a lot of time. And for Isaiah, he's so young, we're not exactly sure yet but we're pretty sure one of his love languages is pizza. <laughs> Last night we had pizza and man, did he put it down. <laughs> so learn to know your children's love languages. So fourthly, the father provides. Fifthly, and this is the one that probably stepped on my toes the most, the father is present. He's present. Verse 18 the son goes, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. The son knew that his father would be there. 
He knew that the Father was waiting for him. His Father was present and longing to be re reunited with him. And, and that's exactly how it is for us as fathers. The challenge that I had is when I go home from work, when I come home from work, can I lay aside my job? Can I lay aside my phone? Can I lay aside my hobbies and all the projects that I have at home and actually be present with my children? It's amazing how quickly they pick up when I'm not with them. I'm there, but I'm not actually there. The children need us to be present. So I challenge you, be present. Be, be there when you're there. And sixthly, the Father protects. We are the gatekeeper for our children. We are there to protect them, especially spiritually. And closely linked with, it is, with this is prayer. Take your children to God in prayer. Plead the blood over them. Give them daily Daily, take, uh, daily lift them up in prayer and also daily teach them and train them. Ironically, something about this story here, the father here actually had to release his son. It didn't feel like the right thing to do, but he had to release his son and allow him to go and experience and learn his lesson, and then it came back and he could protect him once again. I remember a story years ago, it was shortly after we were married, I think Johnny was two or so. I, I'm really picking on Johnny today, but we went to the Wilderness Center to take family pictures. And this was in fall, I'm going to say, probably October, November, and it was getting a little bit cooler. And I, uh, I'm personally, I'm not a big fan of family pictures, but it's something that has to be done. So we were finally done, and we were standing around talking, and all of a sudden we heard Johnny crying like crazy. What's going on? And I look around, and here Johnny is up by the wilderness center by the building, and he found a little fish pond. And he later told me that it was covered in moss, and he thought he could walk across. It looked like it was actually like grass. So he jumped in, and he was about waist deep in this cold water. Well, me as a father, I wanted to protect my son. I jumped in there, clothed and everything, and pulled him out because I wanted to protect him. Johnny's grinning, so all is well. <laughs> so sixthly, the father protects. So looking back, number one, the father prays. Number two, he's patient. Number three, he's passionate. Number four, he provides. Number five, he's present. And number six, he protects. And if you look closely, these are six things that our heavenly father does for us. I'm going to quickly read six scriptures that highlights each and every one. So number one, he prays. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Spirit, God the Father, prays for us. Number two, he's patient. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Number three, he's passionate or loving. This is the verse that Steve shared this morning, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Number four, he provides but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that's Philippians 4, verse 19. Number five, he's present. Matthew 28, verse 20 says, Teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And lastly, he protects. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 3 says, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So we can see God gives us the perfect example here of how to be a godly father. So what do we do from this? I want to challenge, first of all, myself, and also you as fathers and those who are fathering people around you. For the next month, take one of these six. Probably don't try to, probably, I wouldn't advise trying to do all of them at once, but just take one of them. 
focus on it for one month. So if you want to focus on prayer, pray for your children. Do it daily. If you want to focus on patience, be patient. Give them the time that they need to grow spiritually. If you want to be passionate or loving, love your children. Give them the hugs and the attention that they need. If you want to work on providing, work on learning their love languages. Figure out what they need, what they want to hear. And this is the one I want to work on. Be present. Spend time with them and be engaged. And lastly, protect. Take them to the throne. Take your role seriously as a protector of your family. I found this anonymous poem that I thought perfectly encapsulates what we're trying to look at today. It says, I saw tomorrow, I saw tomorrow marching. I saw tomorrow marching on little children's feet. Within their forms and faces, her prophecy now complete. I saw tomorrow look at me from little children's eyes and thought how carefully we would teach if we were really wise. I saw Tamar look at me from little children's eyes and thought how carefully we would teach if we were really wise. My friends, it is so vital that we take our role seriously, teaching and training our children so that they can also do the same thing in the future. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you once again. We thank you so much for being here in our midst today. Lord, I just pray as we look at your perfect example, that we can take some elements of this and apply them to our life. Lord, thank you so much that you are the perfect example, and that you, first of all, loved us, and that gave us the worth and the value. And now we can pass that on to our children and those that we are fathering. Guide us and direct us as we go from here. In your name we pray. Amen. All right.